23. I'm going to ask you a question, first of all. What's the biggest problem in your life? Life presents all kinds of problems. What's the biggest problem that you face in your life? Better yet, what do you think the world's greatest problem is? We know the world has a lot of problems uh, for sure. We see that on the news. We see that quite frequently. But it's a common idea that the world's greatest problems and our greatest problems in our life, they originate in outward, external things. Many people cry, social injustice is the world's greatest problem. There are some people that cry, prejudice is the world's greatest problem. The government is the world's greatest problem. And the list could go on and on. You know, we look at people's negative actions and their, their immoral behavior, and we conclude, you know, there it is. There's the problem. There's the real problem. If that person would just change what's on the outside and conform to my way of thinking, then all problems would be solved and this world would be a better place. However, all that's wrong with this world and all that's wrong within us, it doesn't originate in outward, external things. Rather, it originates in things on the inside, in the heart. Do our greatest problems lie? In our text, we see the true source of our problems. We see that the problems that we have in this world, our greatest problems, the greatest problems in, in us and the greatest problems in this world, they originate on the inside of humanity. And that's what Jesus says in our text tonight. He talks about the true source of our problems and the true solution to our greatest problem in life. Look at, we're going to look at Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23, and we're going to be in the New American Standard Version tonight. Let's look in verse 14. Verse 14 says, After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Now Jesus starts out his statement, uh, what a very, very important dialogue here, very important teaching. He starts it out by saying, are you hearing this? Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? Because what I'm about to tell you is very important. Remember uh, in our previous study and when we looked at uh, Jesus' uh, parabolic discourse, the parables uh, in Mark, uh, he said, Many times, you know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Meaning this is a very important thing that I'm about to say. What I'm about to say carries great significance. And that's what he basically says in our text tonight. A text of great, great importance. Now to understand this in its entirety, we need to keep in mind the events that came previously. Remember, if you were here with us, I think it was two weeks ago when we looked at the first several verses of Mark chapter 7. Uh, we looked at how the Jesus' uh, Galilean ministry is growing. It's growing. He's growing in fame. He's growing in popularity. And his uh, enemies are growing as well. And there are a group of Pharisees that come down from Jerusalem. They, they travel a long distance uh, just to come see this Jesus. And what they're doing in this great journey of going to Jesus, they're looking, these Pharisees, they're looking for an opportunity to discredit Jesus. They're looking for something. They're looking for something in his life, in his teaching, something that's off. Something that they can say, look, he is not who he claims to be. He's not someone special. That's what these Pharisees are doing. They're trying to discredit Jesus, and they find something. They find something. They accuse Jesus and his disciples of defiling themselves. That's going to be a very important term in our discussion tonight. But they accuse Jesus and his disciples of defiling themselves by eating with 
unwashed hands. And remember, as we talked about last time, this, uh, this tradition that the, that the Pharisees had, the tradition of the elders of um, ceremonial cleansing, ceremonial washing, um, it wasn't in, it's not a teaching that is in the law of Moses. It was a tradition passed down um, from, uh, from their elders. It was not in the word of God. And Jesus calls them out on it. He says in verse 6 of Matthew or Mark 7, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, you Pharisees, as it is written, This people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain, Jesus says, do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So we see here in this text that the Pharisees, they try to discredit Jesus by accusing him of not keeping their own man-made traditions. Say, look, Jesus and his disciples, they don't uh, wash their hands before uh, they, they eat. They, they don't uh, cleanse their defiled hands and wash away all the filth and uncleanness and make themselves fit in the presence of God. They don't keep these traditions that we have made. That's their accusation that they make against Jesus. And essentially, they're elevating their own word to the same status as the word of God. And on this, you know, Jesus takes this statement of theirs and their accusation and their attempt to discredit him, and he turns the tables on them and discredits them. He says in verse 9, you are experts, experts at setting aside the command of God in order to establish your tradition. The Pharisees travel all that way to try to discredit Jesus, but it's almost humorous how Jesus ends up discrediting them by their own accusation and by their, their worldview, by their use of the law. He says that they were experts. You are experts at finding loopholes in God's word so, so, that, so, that, you don't have to, so that you don't have to obey it, <coughs> so that you can get around keeping uh, the law of Moses. And he uses that principle of Corban. As an example, as we looked at last time, uh, the law says, the law of Moses says to honor your father and your mother. And a part of what that means is that you take care of your parents when they reach an age where they can't take care of themselves. Honor your father and your mother, the law says. But the Pharisees said, if you don't want to do that, if that seems hard or you know you want to have some more me time for yourself and you don't want to spend all that time and energy taking care of your parents that when they can't take care of themselves here's what you have to do just take all the money that you would have used in taking care of your parents and set it aside maybe give it to the temple treasury and declare it as corbin say i am going to give this i'm going to dedicate this to god and then you would be released from having to take care of your parents. That's what the Pharisees said. That's what they stood for. And Jesus said, by doing so, by finding this little loophole in the word of God, which is really one of the forms of legalism, by finding one of these little loopholes, you're making void the word of God. So that's the backdrop. That's the background of our text tonight. Uh, the, the, so the Pharisees, they say that, um, that defilement, remember they accuse Jesus of eating with defiled hands. They say that defilement originates in outward external things, like not w ceremonially washing your hands before, your eat, before you eat. That's their worldview. That's um, the, the, uh, the, the perception of the law, of how God works. That's the way that, um, that, they, saw, that they saw things. They, they say that defilement originates in outward, external things. But Jesus says in our text, he says, listen, defilement, it doesn't originate on the outside of a person, but it originates somewhere else. Look with me in verse 15 of Mark chapter 7. Verse 15. Jesus says, 
There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. Now let's pay attention to that word defilement for a moment. That might not be a word we use in everyday speech. Let's try to wrap our minds around this. It's a very interesting word, the word defilement. Uh, so to, 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 to understand um, what Jesus is saying here, we, we have to wrap our minds around this word and around what it, what it means. To be defiled, uh, another way that you can say that and attempt to understand it, to be defiled is to be unfit for God and His presence. You are in a state, you are in a condition in which you are unfit to be in the presence of God if you are defiled in this way. We look at the law, we look at the law of Moses. The law of Moses describes God as holy. God is holy. And a way to understand God's holiness that helps me is to think about the sun. God's holiness is like the sun. The sun is beautiful. It's awesome. It's, it's glorious. But if you get too close to the sun, if you hop on a rocket ship and take a trip up to the moon and get too close, what is it, what's going to happen? It's going to kill you. It's going to annihilate you. God is so holy and good that if you approach his presence in an improper state, like if you approach the sun, then you'll be incinerated. God's holiness. And that's why you see in the law of Moses, especially in the book of Leviticus and in other books as well, but that's why you see in the Old Testament a detailed description of what will make you unfit for God or what will defile you. Um, and what to do if you do become unclean or impure. We see in Leviticus and other books as well, things like um, the difference between clean and unclean animals. There's a certain animal group that if you come in contact with them or if you eat them, uh, then you will be unclean or impure. Uh, we see uh, outward external things such as like Touching dead bodies. Touching a dead body would make you ceremonially impure or unclean. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have sinned, uh, but it just makes you ceremonially unclean. We also see outward external things like coming in contact with certain bodily fluids. Um, and there's, there are other things as well. But the law of Moses, it tells us many outward external things such as these that will defile a person or make them unfit for God under the old covenant. However, all of these outward external things, uh, the, just the things that I mentioned, for example, uh, clean, unclean animals, dead bodies, bodily fluids, they're symbols. They're symbols used to communicate a much deeper spiritual reality. You know, eating a pig uh, which would be considered uh, an unclean animal, pork, um, according to the kosher food laws in, um, in the law of Moses. Eating a pig, Jesus is trying to say, is getting to the original intent of the law, the spirit of the law. Eating a pig doesn't really actually defile a person. Touching a dead body is not what makes a person unfit for God. Eating with unwashed hands, as the Pharisees accused Jesus of, isn't what makes you unclean. Jesus is saying that defilement, being unfit for God, doesn't originate on the outside of a person through external acts and rituals. Defilement originates on the inside of a person, and it's seen most clearly by what emanates from a person, by what comes out of a person. Notice with me in verse 16 of Mark chapter 7. Look with me there. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, 
Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart but into his stomach and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. Now, very briefly, and this is a question you might ask when you see this text, depending on what translation you're using. If you're using the New American Standard, you might see verse 16. It's in brackets. Um, And that's that's because uh, the older Greek manuscripts uh, that um, we have discovered don't contain this verse. So some translations put that verse in brackets and put a footnote at the bottom explaining that. Some translations omit it all altogether, but that's why, that's why it's in brackets, <laughs> uh, just if you had a question about, about that. Um, so after, uh, after Jesus says these things, you know, he enters, he enters a house and his disciples begin to ask him, they, they begin to ask him about it. He says, what is... What, what does this mean? And, and if, you really, if you think about it, this, what Jesus said here, this would be very shocking to a first century Jew, a, a, a culture that is just so accustomed with uh, being careful not to do anything that would defile themselves um, or, or cause them to be unclean, a culture that would be very hypersensitive to these things. We wouldn't be today because we don't live under the law of Moses. But in a culture that did live under, this, under the Jewish system, they would be very hypersensitive to um, all of these laws and rituals and, and, and things not to do and what to do if you did become, in a, in a, in, in, if you did, uh, become unclean or, or enter into an impure state. So Jesus' statement here would have been extremely shocking uh, to his disciples. And so they want, him to, they want him to explain this. They're like, they, they, they essentially say, Jesus, what? <laughs> help, help us to understand these things because this isn't in sync with our worldview. And Jesus, he basically says, you know, guys, you've been with me a long time. You've been with me a long time now, and, and, you, and you, still, you still don't get these things? You still can't see these spiritual realities? He says that outward things, such as food, can't be the source of defilement. It can't be the source of defilement. And there are many scholars and people today uh, that think Jesus here in this statement, in this text that I just read, many people think that he's trying, trying to expose the illogic of the Pharisees. Uh, if you look in uh, the Pharisees' beliefs, some extra biblical sources, you'll see that the Pharisees didn't really consider human uh, excrement as unclean. Um, they, didn't, they didn't see what comes out of the body as a source of uncleanness. So Jesus' argument here is how, how could outward things such as certain foods, how could those things be the source of defilement if it passes through your body and is converted into something that isn't defiled? <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, that's the argument that Jesus is using. But Jesus says, no, no. That's not how it works. That's not the intent of the law. The source of defilement doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. That which comes out of a person is what makes them unfit for God. In verse 21, look with me there in Mark 7. For from within... Out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. In Jewish thought, we see this word heart here. According to the Jewish worldview, the heart is the seat of the mind, the emotions, 
the will. What is in your heart is who you really are. That's who you really are. What is on the inside of you and what comes out of you emanates from your heart and exposes your internal condition. Evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Jesus is saying that these things, these things show you that there's a problem, a big problem on the inside of a person. These things are outward manifestation of a major internal problem. These things make you unfit for God. And the fact of the matter is, is that some form of these things comes out of every human heart. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9 through 10 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. All these problems that we see within the world today, you know, we turn on the news and we see all kinds of things. Uh, and all, all of us you know, know uh, that there are a lot of problems uh, going on in the, in the world today. That's, that's, that's pretty much a given. But all of these problems that we see in the world today are just effects of the real problem inside of the human heart. You know, we've seen, all of us have probably heard of the um, Israeli war with Hamas. It's something that is on our minds. It's something that Anna and I have been, have been paying attention to and, and praying for. You know, we see the murdering of innocent people. We see killings. We see, uh, we see people hating each other with a deep-seated hatred. And all of that just shows you that there is something majorly wrong on the inside of the person. All of those things are outward manifestations of a much larger internal problem. But let us not just think of things like murder uh, and, and this kind of hatred. Uh, it's, it's not just atrocious things like that what, that would cause us, that would shock us and say, look, there's the depravity of mankind. It's the murder, it's the hatred that we see within our world today. It's not just these kind of atrocious outward things that expose the human condition, that expose the human heart, but it's small things like lust and gossip and little white lies and the pride, the self-exaltation that we pursue in our lives are manifestations of a much greater problem. Brothers and sisters, we need to think this way. <laughs> we need to have this world view. This is very important to the Christian system. Having this view of the world, having this view of humanity, that there is a major problem. That our greatest problem doesn't come from outward external things, but originates from the heart of mankind. We need to think this way consistently because it's only when we have this kind of a worldview are we able to see the true beauty and glory of God. We see how beautiful and glorious God is in His action to give Himself as a sacrifice so that the evil, corrupted human heart might be clean and might be washed, able to live in the presence of God, fit for God. Praise God. 
praise God for these things, that because of Jesus, we have a new heart, a new heart, a new transformed existence, and we're continuously being conformed to His likeness every single day. We need to think this way. Thinking this way is at the center of the gospel message. You know, all kinds of people, there are all kinds of people today that occupy pulpits, um, that, uh, that, that, that preach, uh, that, just, that, are, that are just average, everyday people um, that are, are Christians. All kinds of people today try to talk about Jesus and preach the gospel, but shy away from the real problem, the true condition of the human heart. We see it over and over and over again. The good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't make a lick of sense if people don't realize their true condition. If people don't realize that they need a Savior, that there is a major problem on the inside. The gospel only makes sense if we are people that uphold the true condition of the human heart. We need to be a people that see our own need of a Savior because it draws us to Him. If we have this superficial view of the human heart and we say, oh, at the core of everyone, everyone's a good person. There's a little bit of good in everybody. And somehow God's going to look at that and say, oh, you know, bless their heart. They helped an old lady across the street. They're, I'm going to let them into my heaven because there's a little ounce of goodness within them that they have accomplished. I'm going to respond to them positively because of something good in them. If we have that kind of view, if that's our worldview, what need is there of a Savior? <laughs> what need is there of Jesus Christ? Having this kind of a worldview that Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 7, we see and we continuously see our need of a Savior. And it draws us to Him. It helps me to draw deeper in my relationship and say, God, take my corrupted heart for such a worm as I. Take someone like me and transform me, shape me, and mold me because only you have the power to do so. We need to think this way. We need to be a people who help others in love, in love. We need to be a people who help others in love to understand their need for a Savior. You know, it's, I think it's hard for us to think this way uh, sometimes. I know it is me, my, myself, uh, to consistently have this kind of a worldview. You know, when, when we see our friends, uh, when we see people that we're close to, and, and we maybe that aren't Christians or, or are just good people but never really showed any interest in faith. We, we, we see them as their friends and, and we look at their lives and sometimes their lives, maybe they're, they're put together. There's not any kind of gross immorality in their life. Um, they aren't extremely immoral people. And, and it tempts us to think, you know, I guess they're okay. You know, they're not a murderer. <laughs> they're not a, a horrible uh, cretin. Uh, they're, not a, they're not a terrible person. What's the big deal? They seem like they have it all together. But the fact of the matter is, is that God doesn't look at the outside. God doesn't look at the external. God looks at the internal, at the condition of the heart. And the fact is, and we learn from this text tonight, is that no one, will approach the holy presence of God with a defiled heart. The only way for people to be saved, to embrace the blessed Savior, is through Jesus Christ, the Savior. And we need to be a people who help others to see this, to, to help them to understand their need, their need for a Savior Jesus says in verse 23, 
in Mark chapter 7, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. So what's the message tonight? Uh, It's not a negative message. It's a very positive message. It's the good news. The human heart is corrupt, but we have a Savior. When we accept that Savior, when we submit to that Savior and respond to His conditions of salvation, He takes a heart heart like ours, molds it and shapes it and transforms it into something beautiful. And if you are a Christian tonight, you are undergoing that transformative process of being conformed into the image of Jesus. The greatest thing that you can do with your life is to proclaim this gospel, is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are defiled in heart, because it's only through the gospel can our real problems in this world be solved. Tonight, if anyone has any need, if you need to respond to the invitation, it's open to you as we stand and as we sing.